Thank you for joining us for today's discussion of the book, Open, the Story of Human Progress, released in the US yesterday by Atlantic Books. My name is Chelsea Follett, and I am a policy analyst in Cato's Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity, as well as managing editor of humanprogress.org, a website that chronicles with data the incredible progress that humanity has made thanks to policies and institutions promoting freedom and openness. The ideal of an open world faces many challenges, including infectious diseases like COVID-19 and a rise in economic protectionism and liberal policies. But as the book that is the topic of tonight's discussion argues, openness is critical to human progress. The freedom to explore and exchange has led to stunning achievements in science and culture, as well as unprecedented wealth and opportunity. Yet humanity has always struggled with a constant tension between its yearning for cooperation and its profound need for belonging to a particular tribe. The author will explain why we're often uncomfortable with openness and why it is nonetheless essential for human progress. He will explain why an open world and an open economy are worth fighting for, now more than ever. Tom Palmer will also comment on the book's sweeping history and relevance. I am pleased to introduce the book's author, Johan Norberg. Johan is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute and a writer who focuses on globalization, entrepreneurship, and individual liberty. Johan's articles and opinion pieces appear regularly in both Swedish and international newspapers, and he is a regular commentator and contributor on television and radio around the world, discussing globalization and free trade. Johan is the author and editor of several other books exploring liberal themes, including Progress, 10 Reasons to Look Forward to the Future, named by The Economist as one of the best books of 2016. Prior to joining Cato, Johan was head of political ideas at Timbro, a Swedish free market think tank from 2003 to 2005. He then served as a senior fellow for the Brussels-based Center for a New Europe during 2006. Johan received his master's degree from Stockholm University in the history of ideas. I am also pleased to introduce Tom Palmer, the George M. Jaeger Chair for Advancing Liberty and Executive Vice President for International Programs at the Atlas Network, who is responsible for establishing and operating programs in 14 languages and managing programs for a worldwide network of think tanks devoted to creating a more open world. He is also a senior fellow at the Cato Institute and director of Cato University. Before joining Cato, he was an H.B. Earhart Fellow at Hartford College, Oxford University, and Vice President of the Institute for Humane Studies at George Mason University. He also frequently lectures in North America, Europe, Eurasia, Africa, Latin America, India, Asia, and the Middle East on political science, public choice, civil society, and the moral, legal, and historical foundations of individual rights. He has published reviews and articles on politics and morality in scholarly journals such as the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, as well as in publications such as the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and the Washington Post. Tom received his BA in liberal arts from St. John's College and his MA in philosophy from the Catholic University of America and his doctorate in politics from Oxford University. After their discussion, our speakers will be taking questions from you, the audience. You can submit questions via our event webpage through Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. Please use our event hashtag, hashtag Cato events. Uh, feel free to start posting your questions now before the Q&A begins. We'll get to as many as we can. So without further ado, Johan will now tell us some more about the book to be followed by comments from Tom, and then we will start taking questions. Thank you very much, Chelsea, and um, good afternoon or, or evening, uh, which is uh, the 
time uh, zone that I'm in, in Stockholm, Sweden, right now. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted to uh, get this stage and to, to talk about my new book. And I'm also spe specifically delighted to uh, share the stage with Tom Palmer, who has often, so often been a source of inspiration when writing about things like this. This book, Open the Store of Human Progress, is a um, history book and a psychology book. It is about openness in human history and, and closeness and in the human mind and how they have interacted for uh, millennia. Chelsea has written a lot on human progress and, uh, and, and so have I and, and many others in the Cato family and is especially focused on the fact that we're in an unprecedented era right now when it comes to human progress. But the starting point of this book is that we've had many golden eras in history. Uh, it's not a particularly Western story. It's not a Eurocentric story or an American one. We've had golden eras in different cultures, eras of rapid uh, growth of scientific knowledge, technological innovation, and economic productivity. We've had them in all sorts of cultures and religions, in ancient, ancient Greece, Phoenician society, pagan Rome, in Muslim Abbasid Caliphate, uh, the Confucian Song China in Catholic Italian city-states. And there are two common denominators between these very different cultures. The first one is that they were all, relatively speaking, for its time, open to the rest of the world. Not in a classical liberal sense, often uh, consisting of vicious warlords and authoritarian regimes, but relatively open for trade, exchange, migration, and new ideas from within society and from without. So they were more open to surprises coming from new strange places. As Montesquieu wrote, the French Enlightenment thinker wrote about the Romans, the main reason for the Romans becoming masters of the world was that having fought successively, successively uh, against all peoples, they always gave up their own practices as soon as they found better ones. And Jack Weatherford, the historian, wrote about uh, Genghis Khan and the Mongol invaders, that they had no system of their own to impose on their subjects. So therefore, they were willing to adopt and combine systems from anywhere. They simply searched for what worked best. In other words, these cultures were relatively open. The other common denominator was that they all ended at one point or another. All those golden eras in history ended, except this one, at least so far. So what's my argument? Why does openness create progress and why is it so often threatened? Well, let's start by looking at human beings and why we've come this far. And therefore, we should start by looking ourselves in the mirror. Or you can actually look into my eyes. Look at the white of my eyes, the white sclera, the part of the eye that surrounds the cornea. It's white, and that's actually a rarity in the animal kingdom. When we go to our ape cousins, we see that they have brown sclera. Because for one reason or another, they got an evolutionary advantage by not broadcasting their attention to the other apes, to their flock. If they found a potential prey or a partner, they didn't want to give it away to the others because they wanted to keep it for them to themselves. Whereas for human beings, our evolution took another interesting turn. We came to possess a cognitive niche where it made sense to broadcast our attention to others. If we saw a potential prey or a predator, it made sense to broadcast that attention to the others. Wipes clearer so that we saw what we were looking at. Because then others could help us and they could surround the prey and throw stones at them or attack the predator uh, together so that we would be more successful. This supercharged our development in various ways. We developed the skills of intelligence, 
ability to communicate and cooperate. And they reinforced one another. The more intelligence, the more we had to communicate, the better we could cooperate. And if we could cooperate, it made even more sense to have more intelligence so that we could cooperate in better ways. So human beings, we don't have super strength. We don't have a natural panzer. We have, uh, we can't even fly. We're pretty bad at swimming, but we've got something else. We've got each other. We've got the ability to use the ideas and learn from the insights of others and the hard work of other people. And civilization, as Hayek pointed out, is to be able to use knowledge that you do not possess yourself. And then the more you're open to ideas and innovations from other places, the better off you are. And that's what we saw in history's great efflorescences, these cultures that managed to prosper dramatically because they began to open up and learn from more groups of people. And they were in the intersections between different cultures, different groups and different economies. And therefore, they could also make use of more brains and more labor. And when we protect this with systems of rule of law and at least relative international peace over a longer period, the result is the greatest civilization ever. And that's what we're in right now. Over the last 200 years, we've increased life expectancy from around 30 years to more than 70 years globally. We've reduced extreme poverty from around 90% to 9% today. We are here and we can have this event, even though we are on different continents because of it. And we come up, can come up with a vaccine against COVID-19 by working together across the Atlantics. Uh, Turkish immigrants to uh, Germany, and American multinationals, and they can fly the genetic material in Pfizer's corporate jets, which could take off even though America and the European Union tried to stop uh, all flights during the pandemic. So that's the good news. Openness creates this tremendous progress. But there are some bad news too. If it's so great, why does it seem like we're often intent on ruining it all? Because there's one tiny bit of a problem. Human beings develop this ability to cooperate harmoniously, at least partly in order to kill others. Because the moment that we got onto this evolutionary path, when we were able to cooperate within our group, within our band, within our tribe successfully, and we could surround all the cat animals on the savanna, surround them and throw stones at them, we climbed to the top of the food chain. No predator could ever threaten us again, except one, other human beings, other groups that cooperated even more efficiently and could become a threat to us and kill and steal us. And so for two reasons, we developed a great concern with us and them, with our group and the other group. The first reason is that other tribes could be a threat. There was often warfare in humans prehistory. And if they cooperated more successfully, they were a lethal threat to us. So we had to be constantly worried about what was going on among the neighbors. Or on the other side of the river, on the other side of the mountain, in the other country. And the second reason is, since we learned to sacrifice short-term gains to cooperate for larger gains, we had to concern ourselves with the cheats, those who don't want to cooperate but want to share in the spoils. We had to look at who didn't fit in, who wasn't a team player, who, wasn't, who, who is not like us because they could threaten all of us. And so, so, so this origin of uh, one of our most impressive traits, our ability to cooperate and quickly come to new terms with others, even with strangers and find common ground and cooperate in a dramatic way. Well, the um, original sin, if you like, is that 
this was probably developed partly as a um, mutual armament arms race between various bands of human beings and we were incredibly concerned and we're still incredibly concerned with our place in the group and our group's relationship to the other group and we can see this in any kind of experiment today when we divide people into almost arbitrary groups that we become loyal to this almost arbitrary group almost instantaneously one team of researchers divided students into two groups depending on what they thought of uh, two modern painters that they had never seen art from before uh, clear and kandinsky and then they divided them and said that okay let's play an economic game now and you're going to play this economic game where you basically divide uh, uh, the goodies with others strangers people whom you have never met before and that you will never meet again and the first thing that you notice is that people become loyal to their group if you happen to like that kandinsky painting you want to benefit others who also liked kandinsky but it's actually a little bit worse than that it's not just that we become loyal to an arbitrary grouping. It's also that we want to punish the other team, those who liked Clear rather than Kandinsky. So it's not that you want to maximize the benefit of others, strangers who liked Kandinsky, if you like Kandinsky. It's that you want as much separation as possible between the Kandinsky group and the Clear group. So you're willing to forego a benefit for your Kandinsky group if it results in even less for the Clear group. Which sounds just horrible. Um, it's, it sounds like some people just want to watch the world burn. Uh, but it makes sense if you understand that these, this tribal mentality comes from an era when the clear group, and it might be an arbitrary grouping, they just might happen to have ended up on the other side of the mountain. Uh, their benefits could be a threat to you. If they were successful, it could threaten your life as well. Because even though we've had uh, mutual exchange and trade uh, as long as we've had Homo sapiens, it's fairly new to have it on a large scale, ongoing with strangers, at least in a global uh, way, where we see rapid economic growth and rapid innovation so that people saw in their own lives, that uh, during their own lifespan, that all groups could become better off simultaneously. Instead, what people saw was that if someone else was more successful, it was probably because they had stolen your goods. It's only in the last 200 years that we've really seen on a global scale that uh, most groups have been able to be better off simultaneously uh, in their own lifespans. If Homo sapiens 300,000 year history is condensed into the last 24 hours. The two centuries when almost everything happened, when we really began to see that life can improve for all groups and nations simultaneously, is the last minute. It's an amazing minute. Those 60 seconds, that's when, where we have all our lifespan, our health, our um, wealth our literacy, our opportunities, almost everything happened, comes from those 60 seconds. But that's not where our instincts come from. That's not where our attitudes come from. They come from the previous 86,400 seconds. And that's why we so often return back into the belief that the world is a zero-sum game, that the other group is a threat to us and we have to stop them before they stop us, especially when we feel threatened in times of depressions, invasions, disasters, pandemics. It often triggers a societal fight or flight reaction when we want to disappear in the tribe. So let me just end by um, retelling the old East European fable, which I think summarizes the threat to openness that uh, lies within us in 
our double nature of being both open and closed, being both traders and tribalists. There is an Eastern European fable called Vladimir's Choice, when the poor peasant farmer Vladimir, it's his lucky day because God suddenly appears before him and tells him, look, I'll make you happy. I'll give you anything. And Vladimir gets, gets very happy about this, obviously, until he realizes that there is a caveat. God points out, whatever I give to you, I will give twice over to your neighbor, Ivan. Which is awful, because Vladimir doesn't want to benefit his neighbor like that. So he keeps on thinking, what, how, should I, how should I deal with this? And then suddenly he comes up with an idea. Please, God, take out one of my eyes. Because in that case, God will take out two of his neighbor's eyes. Of course, we don't act like that individually, and that's what makes this story so weird. But whenever we start to think of ourselves as members of a tribe in rivalry with another tribe, we do. And that's when we start to build walls and start trade wars, dismantle liberties to hurt the others even more, which takes out one of our eyes, because we lose access to ideas, innovations, specializations, and, and surprises that we need to create flourishing societies. So there I'll end, because we've come full circle. We've started with what makes our eyes unique, the white sclera of our eyes. And we've ended with why we so often take out one of our eyes to spite the neighbors. And that is how history's open civilizations have all been destroyed. All of them except this one. This may yet be saved. Thank you. Thank you, Johan. Uh, Tom will now begin his dialogue with you before we open to questions from the audience. As a reminder, please post your questions using the hashtag Cato Books, and you don't have to wait until the Q&A to start posting your questions. Tom? Well, thank you very much, Chelsea, and thank you, Johan, for this book. It's normal in a book forum to pick someone who will be critical, who will test the book's thesis, argumentation, factual claims, and so on. So that's part of my job. But it's not because I think that this book is somehow defective or wanting. I have to admit, I found it awesome. It's a serious contribution to our knowledge about human flourishing. It's scholarly without being pedantic. It has hard questions. It critically examines how we could answer them. And then it looks for answers that meet reasonable criteria. It's synoptic, it draws on political, economic, social, and legal history, on economic theory, on sociology, on paleoanthropology, and on empirical psychology to explain and to make the case for free and open systems of human cooperation. It was a really delightful read, and I have to say, following up on the footnotes is going to keep me busy uh, for weeks to come. In a word, <laughs> awesome. Everyone should order the book and then set aside the time, whether one big chunk over a weekend or just an hour a day for a week uh, to read the book. So now I want to explore some questions that I think a second edition of the book might address, or maybe another book. Uh, specifically the roots of the great enrichment, which so far has outstripped all other periods of human flourishing. That is to say, those last 60 seconds of human history that Johan described, if you look at the vast sweep of all of the history of our species. So let me start with uh, a positive part of the book. It very effectively addresses what I call essentialism their cultural essentialism, the idea that there's some unique cultural or religious or in more extreme versions, even racial ingredient in a social order that determines its path. And we run into that uh, periodically. Years ago, I participated in a conference uh, in which I read the ethical treatises of Aristotle and of Confucius and compared them. And one attendee at the end said, that he concluded from the readings, he now understood how starting with Aristotle gave you James Madison and the American Constitution, and starting with Confucius gave you Mao Zedong and the Cultural Revolution. It, it was authentically one of the 
the dumbest things I'd ever heard. And I commented that a lot of things that happened in between Aristotle and Madison or between Confucius and Mao Zedong. And those were important. Uh, but that thesis, some version of it keeps coming back. More recently in a very poorly argued book by Larry Seedentop, in 2014 called Inventing the Individual, the Origins of Liberal Individualism. And Seaton Top offered this very bold thesis that it was St. Paul that set us on the path. It was his unique understanding of the message of Christ that provided an ontological foundation for the individual. Interesting claim. Seaton Top didn't bother to ask why other regions that also used the Pauline gospel, notably Russian Orthodox Christianity, did not endorse that. Now, Johann's book does not suffer from this kind of weakness. It's a very robustly comparative approach, and I love that about it. It asks serious questions and then goes out and compares different cultures and histories. But there's something I think in common with Seton Top. I think that, uh, Johann, you've passed over what I think is a very important development in European history the Gregorian Reformation of the 11th century, which was an institutional revolution that made the church independent of the empire and the various kingdoms. And it generated a big crack in power, a fissure, a split from which many other cracks emerged. And that strengthened the remarkable fracturing and diffusion of power in Europe that you document. And that competition of jurisdictions within a wide common cultural space, I think was an essential ingredient in the openness that you, you celebrate. Now in turn, that was due to the prior collapse of Roman imperial power in Europe, perhaps best punctuated in 476 when the last Roman emperor in Rome was expelled uh, by one of his German generals, Odovacar, which meant that the Bishop of Rome uh, was still there and began to acquire these trappings of the Roman Imperium, but without the military power that had sustained the empire. So you get the spread of this common religious body across Europe that interpenetrated a number of political and military orders, created a common culture that was governed by a multitude of different political systems. That meant that exit costs were lowered. If you were to move from one to another, you were not cast into a completely foreign circumstance, uh, but you could leave in search of better conditions, notably more legal rights. In other words, a higher degree of openness. So Europeans were spared being ruled by one empire and then another important accident that you do address, which is the death in 1241 of Ogadai Khan when the Mongols were poised to get all the way to the um, uh, channel, all the way across Europe, and the great Khan died, and the princes all returned to Kirkworm to elect a new Khan. They never came back, but they devastated Russia with the golden horde that remained, and then, which you document very well, the devastation of the sack of Baghdad in 1258, and then invasions of China and India and other regions. So it turns out being spared conquest by the Mongols had a number of pretty important uh, advantages. And then also being spared one overarching empire over the entire Europe, something that was made possible by the independence of the church, was another important uh, ingredient, you know, the separation of the spiritual uh, and the secular. And that made possible this highly competitive uh, legal order. The second area that I think would have benefited from more attention, maybe a second edition or another book, uh, is that the foundations for the rule of law were rooted in the legacy of the Roman law, which was in fact a kind of decentralized legal order in itself. Uh, and then the further decentralization of the legal system that the Gregorian Reformation made possible. The late legal historian Harold Berman in his wonderful 1983 book, Law and Revolution, the Formation of the Western Legal Tradition, focused on that Gregorian Reformation, the independence of the church as the key to what differentiated Europe from other regions of the Eurasian land mass. Now, what some people might find paradoxical 
is it the rule of law, common legal principles that are stable and predictable, generally applicable over many regions, peoples, kingdoms, and individuals, was the result not of a legal monopoly, but of legal competition. And I think that was a really important issue that was absent from your book uh, or touched on very lightly. And lastly, and this is a very controversial topic, you argue that modern marriage and family systems, namely marriage that's based on free choice and the establishment then of independent households, the married couple leaves and set up their own household, was an outcome of the general prosperity and rising incomes. But there's also an argument that the marriage system was a condition for the social order that made that prosperity possible. In other words, that you got the, the historical order and the causal connection backwards. That's argued by Joseph Henrich in his brand new book, The Weirdest People in the World, How the West Became Psychologically Peculiar and Particularly Prosperous. He argued that changes in religious doctrines changed social practices and created a very different social order that was not based on the competition of clans. And that was a foundation for something you do emphasize repeatedly throughout really right, of cross-cutting loyalties as a part or an ingredient of, a, of an open system. It means when people might come into conflict, there are multiple peacemakers, people who have loyalties with both parties who can step forward because their loyalty is not entirely absorbed by one party. They have cross-cutting allegiances. So I recall being in Iraq uh, a number of years ago, and I had uh, lunch with a number of Iraqi men, and two of them said, well, they were the black sheep of the family. I said, in what way? They said, well, we married outside of the family. Now, to most Europeans or, or North Americans, that's a very odd thing. Uh, it was expected that they would have married cousins, and they did not, so they were considered uh, black sheep. The reason why that's important is that the family, when it's based, basically uh, based on marriage among cousins, is a kind of closed social grouping that confronts others. And the only people you can trust in that situation are your own family members. You don't trust someone from another family. When that system is uh, broken down, as it is changing around the world, but as it changed earlier uh, in Europe, you end up with people who marry into and across uh, family lines. And as a consequence, you don't just have clans facing each other. So the argument that has been uh, presented is that what you say is an outcome was actually a condition uh, for the change. Now, there are a lot of other questions that are raised by this amazing and I'd say beautiful book. I look forward to, to uh, hearing your response and also to your future writings on this issue. I'll end by saying one point. I thought the discussion of tribalism or authoritarian groupiness or populism at the end was outstanding. It's not just a triumphalist book. You, you end with challenges and questions uh, for us to, to address as thinkers, as social scientists, and maybe most importantly, as citizens. So congratulations on a really wonderful work. you both. We are now going to go to Q&A. Again, please submit questions via our event webpage or via Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. And please use our hashtag Cato Books to ensure that we see your questions. And we already have a lot of great ones. Uh, Toby asks, and I think both of you will want to opine on this, uh, Toby says, throughout history, open has often come at the tip of a sword, or more recently, some incredibly harmful policies to many, so not willingly open, rather dominated. How do we make this a shared goal so that any rising tides truly do raise all ships? I think that Toby might be referring to some of the empires that I've, I talked about and that I write about in the book. Um, 
the Roman Empire, um, even the Mongol Empire. Uh, Genghis Khan was a vicious war warlord, but um, he had fairly meritocratic standards, religious liberty and free trade within the empire. Um, many of these uh, empires were incredibly brutal and uh, spared not a soul who opposed them. Um, but that does not mean that openness uh, is created at the at a tip of the sword, because all cultures, all uh, empires were vicious and brutal uh, at, at this time um, in history. What my case is that those who were successful were the ones that were more open to new ideas, uh, new thoughts, innovations from various parts of their empire. If they made it possible for strangers, uh, for ethnic minorities to make a career in the army or in politics, for uh, example. Uh, when Claudius said about um, the Gauls in, um, in the Roman Empire that, um, look, they can even make it into the Senate. And, and I'm, <laughs> they could eventually uh, come from the periphery of the empire and become the emperor, uh, that means that openness was a successful strategy. This does not mean that they were liberals. It didn't, doesn't mean that they were tolerant. It mean, means that they uh, adhered to a strategic tolerance. And, uh, and that's really, I think, a very strong argument for openness. Openness is not really about being warm and fuzzy and, and generous. It's really about self-interest. If you want to benefit yourself and your society, you'd better be open to ideas and innovations from other places to, to enrich you. The case for my liberal case for openness is to give people the option, the choice. That's what uh, free trade is all about. That's what open borders and open societies is about. Not the tip of the sword, but giving people the option to choose from the whole world of, of options and ideas. Can I add a note on that? And that is that um, the idea that you enforce openness on a region, some people have argued this, uh, turns out that generally doesn't have positive consequences. Colonialism and also the whole development industry of exporting institutions using World Bank money and so on hasn't had a very positive legacy. We've seen typically when people achieve their independence that they are more likely to move ahead. But finally, there's another uh, very important set of institutions, again, in Europe that is often overlooked, and that is the Hanseatic League, which created vast amounts of free trade and free exchange of ideas, practices, goods and services. Uh, and it was a, a merchant league. It was not a conquering empire, but they did manage to uh, sweep the North Sea uh, pirates to make uh, shipping and transportation much more secure and to create a vast area within which there was quite free movement of people and goods uh, across an area, but it wasn't an empire in that uh, sense of one single conquering power. They were, it was a vast coalition or alliance of independent and free cities that had uh, these Hansas within them. Uh, Derek asks, and again, uh, this is something you both will likely want to answer. Derek says, the past few years have exposed democracies as still being vulnerable to populist, nationalist demagoguery. How can democratic forms of government be structurally organized in such a way to be biased towards openness instead of protectionism and anti-immigrant sentiments? Well, I think that Can it's I think quite correct and that, 
that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book, because we cannot take this for granted just because we've had fairly open and liberal institutions for a long time. It doesn't mean that they will automatically survive. And especially there's pressure during times of crisis. And we've had some of that now. We've had the, the great financial crisis, the great recession. We've had uh, migration crises. We have a, a new uh, confusion about geopolitics in the future and now the pandemic. That's exactly the kind of setting that it usually triggers this kind of societal fight or flight instinct. And that's used by populists and nationalists to claim that we are the ones who can protect you against a dangerous world out there. I don't think that we can really rig systems to uh, make sure that that does not happen. And in relation to the last question, uh, it's not about the, the tip of, of the sword or anything like that. It's dependent on the convictions of people, whether they understand openness and uh, classical liberalism or, or not. But an important thing that I think that we, now that we have relearned the lesson that uh, we have um, illiberal democracies in various places, um, populists and strongmen uh, from the left and the right who would like to dismantle all civil liberties as long as they just got to get 50% um, of, of the votes once. It teaches us again the importance of uh, counterbalances, of uh, division of powers, of uh, rule of law, uh, which we should have learned to, um, a long time ago got it from the Romans, as Tom pointed out. Um, checks and balances in various ways. We need a new discussion about these things. We cannot use gentlemen's agreements anymore. If we are worried about things that a Viktor Orban or a Nicolas Maduro or a Donald Trump does the moment they get power, then we should be worried about anyone who's in power. Because now we know that um, these kinds of uh, of uh, people get power once in a while. So I think we re need to uh, renew that uh, discussion about uh, counterbalances and make sure that uh, democracy is not just the majority beating up the minority, but it's always based on individual rights. If I can add a, a note on that, I think it's important to understand uh, um it's not just a style, it's also an ideology, if you will. It's found on the far right and on the far left. The idea that there's one true people uh, and they've been harmed. They're being victimized by some elite, by the 1% or Jews or foreigners or whoever uh, the, the designated enemy happens to be. But the key is the anti-pluralism. There's one true people. They have one will. And naturally, of course, that will be expressed through the leadership of one person, uh, the true authentic leader of the true people. We certainly heard a lot of that uh, in the United States and in some European countries uh, uh, in the last four or five years, uh, a massive dose of that. And I think that needs to be resisted to remind people that there are different identities. There's a plurality and that a free society is about uh, those different people living together peacefully with some common rules and then negotiating and navigating uh, their differences through normal democratic uh, processes. So that's the first point to remind ourselves we are not just one people with one will. Uh, it's variegated. There are many different people in our society with different interests and identities. And then finally, and this is, I think, something that was a very powerful part of Johann's book at the end, is a reminder to ourselves to be the critical thinkers, not to be swept along, not to hate other people who disagree with us, but try to listen to them and see what it is that they're getting at. And that is a, a very strong element to the book. It's in human psychology that explores. And I think that his suggestions in the last chapter uh, are very powerful. And I recommend people read them and take them to heart and try to practice them as we practice not hating other people. We have a two-part question from Tony Morley. Tony says, having 
read your work as well as the work of Steven Pinker, Matt Ridley, Hans Rosling, etc., it would appear that all the recent authorship on human progress stops short of a call to action. My two-part question is, as an average reader, now that I've read your book, what's my call to action? How did you intend or hope to shape my future thoughts and actions? And part two, what is the call to action uh, in your work for the human progress proponents? Uh, those seem like very similar questions to me, and you both may want to opine again. Uh, well, hello, hello, Tony. Uh, that's, those are good questions. So, so what do we do with this? Well, the first thing is that I don't know if you can call it a call to action, but it's really a uh, call for us to uh, to learn and to study and to um, try to uh, when if if you are rationally convinced. And try to convince others about the same thing based on on facts and reason rather than at, at yelling because the the one of the points of my book is that we are up against the most dangerous enemy there is and that's ourselves and our double nature both our inability to understand mutual benefit non zero sum games and innovation because it's all brand new to us. Our brains weren't really developed to, to understand this, but also our um, eagerness to divide the world into us and them, and therefore also being prey, uh, sitting prey for demagogues who want to stir up group hatred uh, between ourselves. So what I'm trying to do is to teach ourselves and myself to uh, not fall for it, not fall for that part of my brain and make us all count to 10 and instead look at the facts and look at history and look at economics and, um, and, and to understand how we function so that we can make sure that, you know, we might have a default setting, but default is not destiny. It can be overridden uh, with, um, by the rational part of our brain. But, um, but the second question then, what's the, is there a call to action for human progress? And I think there is, because there is a, a, a mission out there for those who are interested to, uh, to talk about this. It's still a very, it's still a minority opinion. The very case that human beings create immense progress when we get freedom to do it. It's a minority opinion and viewpoint. And as long as that's the case, people will not be asking, so what makes it possible? Why is openness so important in that case if people don't recognize that progress? So, for example, I think, Tony, isn't that the case that you've started a, uh, a community of, for, for human progress on uh, Facebook and in other places? Well, that's a great starting point. Uh, had I thought of that before I wrote the book, that would have been one of the calls to action to try to uh, create groups that can learn from one another and to help one another in this fight. Well, I'd like to Thank pick you, up Tom, on two things. Any... Uh, yes, uh, Johan does have a call to action in the call for us to, to achieve our moral potential as self-controlling individuals. And I think that that was very powerful and it's rooted in the, the psychology. I would add a little book that I edited, Self-Control or State Control. Uh, and I called on psychologists and others to make uh, practical recommendations of things we can do to try to become more self-controlled, more morally aware, which means not being swept up in us versus them and that, that kind of tribal abdication of responsibility. The last thing that uh, I would emphasize more than Johan, although he's not going to disagree with me, is make a moral case for free trade. Free trade is one of the most important moral causes that we have. It is the cause of peace, as the liberals of the 19th century understood so well. It's not just about increasing productivity or having a little bit more wealth. It reduces hostility among peoples when they trade. 
And there are things you can do there. It means writing to members of Congress, writing to members of parliament, uh, petitioning, writing letters to the newspaper, that free trade is the cause of justice. It is the cause of peace and progress. And I'm, uh, I think that it's really important for us to make that case and to make it publicly. Thank you. We have here, a question here. from Facebook. Yes, here, here. We have a question from Facebook that I would like to initially direct to Tom, although Johan may also wish to opine. Earl Robinson asks on Facebook, how do you negotiate with those who have been radicalized, presumably radicalized against openness? Well, one way is not to respond as they would have you respond. Uh, people who start out with tribalism, uh, they want a tribal response that reinforces their orientation. And when we show people respect individually and ask questions like, can you explain to me why do you think that? Uh, and instead of just starting out by saying you're wrong, we express things in language that's more conciliatory and helps to bring them out. We often find that people can be drawn out of those collectivist uh, mentalities. Uh, it takes time sometimes, but it does mean that we can help them to see themselves as individuals and not just parts of some bigger whole that uh, are um, expendable uh, as collectivist and tribal ideology tends to it. But I think that we should practice respect for other people, uh, not merely preach it, but also practice it. And I think that it is more likely to generate a positive response uh, on the other side then if we just respond, say somehow we're the individualist tribe, uh, that just actually gives in. We're no longer individualists anymore. I love that answer. Uh, Johan, do you have any thoughts or shall we go to the next question? No, I think Tom says it very well. I, I would just add this one thing. It is tempting sometimes uh, to let people know that you're not my friend anymore, and I do not ever want to see you again. When you say these things, when you behave in this way, when you've expressed these uh, vicious liberal ideas and prejudices against minorities and so on. But when we do, we leave people with only one way forward, and that's with their newfound um, anti-liberal closed-minded friends uh, giving not burning bridges but making sure that there's always a way to retreat um, is not just a humane things thing to do but it's also a constructive thing to do thank you this next question is for johan although tom may also wish to comment. Anonymous says, from this synopsis and discussion, the book seems to be focused on Western European traditions. To what extent are your theories applicable to other societies, such as African societies, where the collective seems to be especially important? Are these other societies discussed? I don't think that this is a particularly um, Western European perspective, I, I wouldn't say. Uh, on the contrary, it looks into many different cultures in many different eras and shows that uh, if there's one rule in history, it's that um, progress is not related to particular groups, ethnicities, religious beliefs. It is related to whether you're open to new ideas and innovations from people of other ethnicities, religious beliefs and uh, traditions. And uh, therefore, I think it's possible to look at almost any human culture and see that they have periods of relative efflorescence and relative decline, and it's related 
to the internal struggle in those cultures when they were beginning to open up or when they were closing down. So um, therefore, I'd say it's um, it's at least the um, the least Eurocentric book that I've written. Thank you, Tom. Do you have any uh, comments on how these ideas relate to other cultures? Well, just one very quick one, that to the extent it has a focus on Europe, it's because the great enrichment starts there. But he doesn't argue that it's that it was fated to start there. And that is, I think, one of the key elements. Uh, but if we want to talk about last uh, history of the last 300 years, we do need to talk about Northern Europe and North America, and then this spread globally. But prior to that, there were great periods of efflorescence in other societies as well. And it's just a real strength book that you go there. I'll, I'll leave with one last thought, though. You sometimes hear people talk about Africa as a whole. It's actually a giant, complicated continent full of cultures and civilizations and traditions that many that uh, are uh, quite varied. But one thing we do find that people, I think, read too much into is the importance of extended family as a source of, of business and uh, capital. So George Yite in his new book, Applied Economics for Africa, which you can get online. If you go, go to AfricanLiberty.org, you can download the whole textbook. Uh, he points out that the family is a foundation of the business firm. But it's not the same as arguing that people lose their identity in a collectivity. They're not inherently collectivist. It just happens to be that family firms are more important uh, in much of West Africa than they are at present in Northern Europe. But they have been important in Europe as well at different periods. A great deal of German business is run by the so-called Mittelstand, which are often family-owned companies. So I think that many people read too much into the significance of family structure and business organization. And they, they imply collectivism that I think is, is just completely absent. Shamari Khan asks, at the end of every golden era or openness cycle, were there winners and losers? And if so, how can we change those patterns? This, I think both of you may wish to opine upon. Let me add something. I think that they think lose that. I would say, yeah. was, uh, let me just add, when they end, virtually everyone is a loser. There really aren't any winner, winners at the end of a period of openness. That's a very useful clarification. At the end of openness, it's just stagnation and destruction. And those who thought that they would benefit from uh, a more closed system, uh, they are uh, usually among the biggest losers. But there are always people who think that they stand to lose from openness. And sometimes they do. Uh, we talk sometimes in uh, in history of Cardwell's Law. It was named by Joel Moker, the economic historian, um, based on a technology historian who talked about Cardwell's Law as these incumbents in technology, business, religion, politics, who are fairly happy with the status quo. They don't want surprises. They don't want new innovations or massive trade or new power centers based on new fortunes being made. Uh, they're happy with the way it is. And they are attempting to slow it down constantly with could be monopolies, tariff barriers, regulations to stop innovations. They are constantly at it. Codwell's law is very disappointing. It's, it says that basically they, they always win out in the end. Um, we'll see about that. But there are those groups, obviously, who at least in the short run will lose out because of new innovations or new trade patterns, and they fight against it. The question of what's going to happen is the people on the fence. Uh, where will they end up? Will they suddenly come to the help of those uh, incumbents afraid of change, or will they be 
uh, on the side of openness and progress. And uh, in in history, quite often, when we've seen these crises that result have resulted in a lack of a cultural self confidence, then they've turned inward, and they've lost that spark of of openness. And then everybody's a loser. Thank you, uh, Johan, Tom, and everyone who participated. We had a lot of truly fantastic and thought-provoking questions come in, and I apologize that we could not get to all of them, but we are a minute over time right now. The video recording of the event will be available on Cato's webpage tomorrow. I hope that you all check out the book, Open, the story of human progress. It is a wonderful book that I greatly enjoyed. And I hope that this discussion uh, this evening, or depending on your time zone, you know, morning, afternoon, inspires many more of you to check it out. Thank you.